Well, good morning and welcome everybody to the Johnson Center, the Hoover Institution's outpost in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to you brave party souls who are here this morning after the Washington Capitals big win last night. Uh, and welcome to everybody who's watching online. Uh, our guest today is my friend Shep Melnick. Our Shep Melnick is the Boston College's Thomas P. O'Neill, Jr., Professor of American Politics. Uh, and Shep, on your bio, on your school's website, it explains what you teach. I want to take all these classes from you. Um, you teach on American politics, including the courts and public policy, ideas and institutions in American politics. I'm glad there are some ideas and institutions in American politics. Was that a short class? Uh, they're fast disappearing. That's um, uh, also, bureaucracy, democracy in America, and rights in conflict. He also chairs the Harvard Program on Constitutional Government with our friend and Hoover Senior Fellow, Harvey Mansfield. Uh, Shep writes on the intersection of law and policy as exemplified by his 1983 classic, Regulation and the Courts, The Case of the Clean Air Act. And now he returns to that subject in his most recent book, the one we're here to discuss today, The Transformation of Title IX, Regulating Gender Equality in Education. So, Shep, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. So let's start at the very beginning. What's Title IX? Title IX is uh, a section of the Education Amendments of 1972. Got very little attention at the time. Matter of fact, uh, when President Nixon signed the legislation, he didn't mention it. The New York Times didn't mention it. It simply says that any institution that receives federal funds for education cannot discriminate on the basis of sex. Now, what is discrimination on the basis of sex mean? We've spent the last 45 years debating what that is. Um, and uh, the meaning of that has expanded quite dramatically over time. Yeah, so the exact, I wrote it down, the exact language of, the, of Title IX is this, and it's only about 30 words, mm -hmm. right? It's, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from any participation in, be deemed the benefit, be denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal assistance. Mm -hmm. so it seems pretty straightforward. But as you say very early on in the book, you say, this book traces the slow transformation of Title IX from its original focus on ending exclusionary institutional practices to its current emphasis on deconstructing stereotypes about sex and gender. What does that mean? What's that evolution? Right, what I say is the the initial purpose was to end institutional barriers to edu equal educational opportunity by women. Uh, and there were a lot of them done. There, there was really gross discrimination against women and faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, many programs, many schools um, uh, did not allow women to enter the programs. Uh, so there was really very obvious uh, barriers to opportunity. Today, uh, especially after the Obama administration's expansion of many of these parts of the regulation, uh, the effort is to try to eradicate stereotypes that might limit women's opportunity, but not just the, not those in institutions' policies, but those that are accepted by women, prospective students, faculty members, uh, and members of the general public. And the thing that really surprised me more than anything else was the extent to which Title IX has become an effort to try to re-educate everyone um, about uh, gender roles, about sexual relations, and about, even these days, about what it means to be male or female, which is a transgender issue. Now, you allude early on in the book to the fact that just the process of picking the topic and writing the book was a real process of learning for you, and the, and the book took on, the project took on a much broader shape and scope. Um, as you sort of got into it, and then as the last few years really brought about a lot of fast developments. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about how you arrived on the topic? Sure. Um, because it is, it's an out, it's, it's, it has a lot in common with the other things you've written about, including the Clean Air Act, mm -hmm. um, but in some ways it's very different. So how did you settle on this topic, and, and how did you go about the process of writing the book? Sure. Um, there's a lot of serendipity in this. I decided uh, a number of years ago to write a book on what I call the civil rights state. Uh, which I mean is this, we've developed since 1964 a really extensive set of regulations ab about discrimination on the basis of race, gender, disability, age, many, many other things. Uh, this is a very extensive regulatory apparatus, and it's different from, say, the EPA mm -hmm. um, or other forms of regulation. So I wanted to explore what this looks like 
Uh, one of the characteristics of this regulatory apparatus is what I call uh, institutional leapfrogging. Uh, the agency takes one little step, the court builds on it, the agency builds on that, so you end up with this incremental growth that's quite substantial. Um, and we really hadn't looked at this as a whole in the way we look at the welfare state uh, and say, what, how is the American welfare state both coherent and different from that of Europe? So what I wanted to do is look at what is this regulatory apparatus for civil rights. Um, Title IX was going to be one example of that. Uh, and uh, the more I studied, uh, and this was during the Obama administration's second term when it started to expand and expand. Um, so I realized that I had more than enough for a book about Title IX itself. So the rest of it's going to have to it will be coming in future years, I hope. Oh, the, well, that's good right. to hear. Um, well, let's talk. I wanted to talk a little bit about the civil rights state. Mm -hmm. What do you mean institutionally when you refer right. to the civil rights state? Who is this? Right. Um, that's obviously a key question. And let me just go back to what you were saying about Title IX uh, structure. The, the basic prohibition that you read is quite short and simple. But then there's this uh, extensive other part of Title IX that is about um, the role of the courts the enforcement process and the rulemaking process. And I would just point out two things about this, these kind of boring administrative details. Um, one is that um, the Office for Civil Rights and the Department of Education has the authority to issue rules and regulations to interpret Title IX. Uh, that is subject to the Administrative Procedure Act, as are all rulemaking procedures. And on top of that, uh, the statute says, we think, <laughs> These rules have to be signed by the President of the United States. The idea was that these would be very sensitive, so you wanted political accountability. The last time the Office for Civil Rights went through a major rulemaking procedure on Title IX was 1975. The last time it went through the formal process yes. of making a rule. Right. right. Um, since then, they've done everything through interpretations, classifications, and most recently, dear colleague letters. Uh, they send out a letter to all educational institutions. Uh, saying these are the new guidelines, uh, so that they have really circumvented the, the rulemaking process entirely. The main way in which Title IX was expected to be enforced by it was a threat of revocation of federal funds. Um, the number of times that uh, federal funds have been denied under Title IX is zero. Um, so that enforcement process has never been used. The question then becomes, if you can't revoke federal funds because it's too politically dangerous and too administratively cumbersome, what do you do? The answer was um, enforcement through the courts. Now, Title IX doesn't say anything about court-based enforcement, but the Supreme Court found a so-called implied private right of action um, in the statute, uh, which means that private citizens can bring suits for injunctive relief or for damages for institutions that uh, fail to comply with regulations. Mm -hmm. And the courts have basically deferred to the uh, guidelines, interpretations, dear colleague letters, uh, and that has been the primary enforcement mechanism. So you've got these two deviations of original intent of the law, of the structure. One was on rulemaking, and the other was on court enforcement. But I would say that that's how this leapfrogging happens, because you've got the judicial enforcement, um, and you have the agency guidance writing. Just spell out the leapfrogging point a little sure. bit. When you, right. when, you, when you say leapfrogging, who's leaping, who's leaping whom? Right. Um, everyone's leaping everyone else. <laughs> so let me kind of um, let, just uh, give you a quick example from the transgender regulations. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, 2010, Office for Civil Rights issued regulations, uh, guidance rather, guidance on bullying. It said that uh, if uh, there's bullying on the basis of gender or gender identity or sexual orientation or race, uh, then schools have an obligation to look into it and to try to eliminate it. Um, so that, you know, it's hard to say the school should avoid dealing with bullying. So that seemed like a fairly small step. Um, when the Office for Civil Rights investigated a number of uh, instances of bullying against transgender students, they then added in these individual compliance agreements, you have to give transgender students access to whatever locker room, bathroom, other facility that they choose on the basis of gender identity. 
then the courts looked at what um, OCR had done on, in these agreements and basically said, we're going to defer to their judgment that um, gender identity is protected under uh, Title IX and therefore transgender rights are expanded. Mm -hmm. And then OCR wrote a dear colleague letter saying, we're relying on the courts. Mm -hmm. Um, so everyone is relying on the authority of other people. And I just make a one um, a comment about incrementalism, which is you know, generally a good idea. You, know, you kind of take a small step, you get feedback. But this isn't that type of incrementalism. This is, we're going to rely on our authority, authority of the court, of the agency. So we don't have to look at evidence. We don't have to look at political accountability. We don't have to look at political receptivity. So it's an odd type of incrementalism. So we'll, we will get back to this and uh, to the, the gender issues and, and the more recent disputes. But let's go back to, towards the beginning again. So you have the 1972 Act that mm -hmm. creates this. There's a rulemaking process mm -hmm. with the president at the top of it. Mm -hmm. The rulemaking process sort of ends in 1975. But very quickly, and this is the first part of your book, you focus on the, 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 the regulator's own focus on one very specific aspect of education, right? Title IX mm -hmm. very quickly becomes focused on athletics. Right. Right. Could you tell that story? Sure. Uh, probably most people, when they think of Title IX, think of inter, uh, uh, varsity college athletics. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, that there is, there's a glossy uh, women's apparel catalog called Title IX, which I think is the only um, fashion magazine that's based on a section of the US code. If there are others, let me know about it. <laughs> um, so why was that? Um, when Title IX was debated in Congress very briefly, there was no expectation this was going to be a big deal. There's a very simple reason why it rose to prominence, because it is the major area in education that we segregate by sex. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the, the standard became separate but equal. Yeah. Um, and that's a re area, reason why sex and race are different. You know, we kind of expected when we passed Title IX that you just follow the racial um, precedent. But we couldn't do it in athletics because that would be tremendously unfair to women. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so you can, you can be the basketball team if you can jump as high as the guys um, or run as fast as the guys. So then the question is, what is equal? Um, and uh, there are, this is difficult for a number of reasons. One reason is because of football. Right. Um, right, I saw there's yeah. a line in the book where you say there's three, there's three types of college athletics, men's sports, women's sports, and right. football, which is its own standalone category. Right, and it's, it's a standalone. Number one, they have so many players. Um, to have the same number of players on women's teams, you'd probably need four or five or six teams. Yeah. Um, it's very expensive, and of course, it raises a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So th that, those are really complicating factors. And I just want to point out one thing about athletics, which is the, uh, that we, there are two key choices that were made. One is, what is the standard for equal participation? And the argument that the, uh, the courts made and OCR adopted is that you have to have the number of varsity slots proportional to your total undergraduate enrollment. And since now women are 55 to 60 percent of undergraduates, the argument is that you should aim at having 55 to 60 percent of your uh, varsity athletes be women. Um, and what was rejected was the idea that originally in the 1975 regulations that this should be based on relative interest and ability. So if women are less interested, um, then they don't need, you don't have to buy as many slots. But the idea was, and this is where the stereotyping first came up, which is that, um, that you have to change how women view sports. You have to increase interest, not just among existing students, but you have to go out and recruit students who are more interested in sports until you get up to the target. Um, because you have to overcome stereotypes about women. Uh, and the other was the, the, the really very narrow focus on varsity athletics, mm -hmm. which is those of us who study regulation know that often you, know, you, you focus on one narrow measure. Um, and I think that was a real problem. Yeah, the point about the gender stereotypes is, was a very interesting insight in the book, right? It was not just that, that, that men, university administrators, would have these stereotypes about women. It's that women students themselves mm -hmm. might not be sufficiently interested yes. in sports, and that only if, if only they had the opportunity, mm -hmm. and only they were made better aware that, that they should like sports, that then they would sort of arrive upon <coughs> their, their best understanding mm -hmm. of themselves. Mm -hmm. So Title IX becomes not just discrimination against women, but helping to educate women 
to, to be a better version of themselves. Exactly. The, the slogan of the uh, advocates on women's athletics is build it and they will come from yeah. uh, Field of Dreams. So you have, to, you have to create the opportunities and that will change how women view um, uh, themselves and the role of sports. And now, to some extent, I think that's great. Yeah. Um, on the cover of the book, there's a picture of a lacrosse stick. Yeah. Um, and I insisted upon a lacrosse stick because my daughter played lacrosse. And I think the athletics were just terrific yeah. for her. Um, but what my the criticism that I came to feel very passionately about after research was so much of the emphasis was on high-level, highly competitive varsity sports, and not intramurals, not recreation, not other things. Women might be more sensible in not wanting to p devote all their attention to things they can't play after they leave college. Um, and I think that uh, the emphasis upon uh, highly competitive varsity sports has brought to women all of the problems that have been fallen on men, um, which you know I don't have to tell people the difficulties of of uh, highly competitive male sports at the college level. So this starts with Title IX. Title IX starts with really sports. Mm -hmm. And as the policy is built out, it necessarily builds an infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? This is, I guess, part of the civil rights state in this aspect, mm -hmm. right? You have an infrastructure in government, mm -hmm. but then also an infrastructure in the universities themselves, right? right? You, have, um, you, you, you have the creation of jobs in the universities that are focused on actually complying with, mm -hmm. uh, with Title IX and ensuring that these are carried out. So how does that begin to sort of build out? Right. I mean, that's one of the most interesting things I want to uh, do further research on. Because when I was doing the work on the sexual harassment, sexual assault rules, one of the things to be clear was that the Office for Civil Rights Enforcement Policy involved building compliance organizations within the university. They're very extensive because they have lots of training um, and adjudicatory responsibilities. Um, OCR had a, a a separate Dear Colleague letter on building up these organizations and having them relatively autonomous, reporting only to the top people in the university. Um, they worked very hard, I think very cleverly, to build networks of associations and um, uh, information networks around these organizations so that people who work in these compliance Title IX offices are really more attuned to OCR Mm -hmm. um, and these uh, association of administrators than they are to people in the university. Uh, and this, I, one thing this means is no matter what the Trump administration does to change the rules, these offices are going to be in place and they're probably not going to change what they're doing unless they're forced to do so. Yeah, Shep, I got to say that, that part of your story reminded me a lot of my experience uh, in my legal career mm -hmm in energy and environmental regulation. Like mm -hmm. you, before I was thinking about Title IX, I was thinking about the Clean Air mm -hmm. Act. And it's been interesting to me, especially in the last 16, 18 years now, that, that at the state level, you have the state regulators, the Clean Air Re Act regulators, who at the state level are implementing the federal policy. Mm -hmm. And they're state officials, but they really identify more with the federal yeah. regulators at mm -hmm. the EPA and elsewhere, mm -hmm. and, and, and with one another across state lines, mm -hmm. than they do uh, identify with their own their own state government. Mm -hmm. So you actually have a trade group, you know, the, the, I can't remember what it's called, the National Association of Clean Air mm -hmm. Regulators, something like that, um, uh, where they get together, the, the regulators from each state get together and talk and exchange ideas, mm -hmm. and they've become mm -hmm. sort of a community of their own uh, that interacts with the federal EPA, but, but really is not, uh, it, it, they're more rooted in that than they are in, say, the state of Iowa itself, where, mm -hmm. I'm, where I'm from, or Massachusetts, or, mm -hmm. or whatever. And so I think actually that, that part of the story has real parallels mm -hmm. to the development of these distributed regulatory structures mm -hmm. uh, in general. Yeah, in the political science literature, this is called, sometimes referred to as silos. Yeah. So um, the, 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 the state and territorial air pollution policy administrators mm -hmm. um, are very closely tied to people at EPA and it goes down the logo. I think what we're starting to learn is that those silos go deep into the regulated institutions. Yeah. Um, I've been talking to people about uh, financial regulation yeah. um, and these, very, these huge compliance organizations within banks. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that's happened with environmental regulation as well. Yeah. One of the things I'm interested in is thinking, to what difference does it make that the schools regulated by Title IX are generally not-for-profit? 
Um, what's the difference between profit-making firms and uh, educational institutions? I think one difference is that within schools, um, there are all kinds of constituencies that can be courted by these organizations. There are student activists. There are faculty members. Um, there are offices of student affairs, which is uh, now I consider enemy number one on the campus. Um, and uh, so I think the coalition building opportunities might be greater. But I think this is a, a general phenomenon looking at the power of internal compliance organizations among people who are being regulated. Well, I, I do think in the, in the, even in the for-profit arena, you have a lot of the same dynamics because mm -hmm. you have in any institution, you know, somebody is the chief compliance officer. Mm -hmm. Their career becomes one of, mm -hmm. of reiterating the importance of compliance. And of course, compliance is important. Um, but it, it becomes a, a justification for one's role in the institution. And I think all the usual incentives for building out one's own part of a larger institution mm -hmm. Are the same whether mm -hmm. it's a for-profit mm -hmm. or a non-profit. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're different mm -hmm. in some ways, but in some ways, I think they have a lot in common. Mm -hmm. You said in passing, the Office of Student Affairs is now your least part favorite part of the university mm -hmm. system. Why is that? Uh, what what is yeah. the Office of Student Affairs, by the way? Well, I, I, I for most of my academic life, I really wasn't very much aware of these offices. Um, I now learned that they've grown like topsy um, in almost all universities. Um, they tend to be exempt from reg, uh, control from the, the teaching part of the faculty. Um, and they are engaged in um, uh, training students about uh, uh, sexual harassment, about what proper sexual uh, relations are. One of my pet peeves um, is that they now, across the country, we're having biased incident report teams um, so that you can report, even anonymously, um, if some, someone said something that offends you. No. Um, and uh, I discovered this at my college, Boston College. Um, I uh, hit the roof and I said, I'm not going to have anonymous complaints about the things that I'm saying in my classroom. Yeah. Um, and no one's going to investigate me. I've got to say, to the credit of my dean and provost, they said to student affairs, you have no control over faculty, take this down. Yeah. Um, but I think if you look at um, the restrictions on free speech, um, then you will see, my guess is that uh, Office of Student Affairs in many schools have been quite supportive of this. Yeah, I should say, just in full disclosure, I'm on, mm -hmm. on the board of a new organization called Speech First, which is really mm -hmm. pushing back to nonprofits, mm -hmm. pushing back against mm -hmm. some of these things at public universities. Um, but it is interesting uh, the way that this is built out in mm -hmm. its, own, its own way. And that's one of the, as we said, one of the main stories of Title IX itself is the way that a, a very a very sort of briefly worded law mm -hmm. creates institutions that create mm -hmm. institutions in turn right. um, all the way down. And just to say a word about how um, the regulations spread, yeah. um, if you read uh, most schools' rules about sexual harassment, they will say that this includes um, jokes, comments, innuendos. I love that because, you know, an innuendo can be almost anything, um, a wayward look. Um, and uh, so going from the uh, prohibition that we'd all agree on, you can't, shouldn't discriminate on the basis of sex in educational institutions, yeah. we're way out um, on the interpretation frontier. So let's move on to harassment in just a second. But before that, sure. I do want to focus briefly on the Office of Civil Rights. We right. keep referring yeah. to it. Right. But why don't you describe what, what the OCR is and where it came from? Sure. Um, the Office of Civil Rights um, started off as a very small office in the old uh, HEW, the Office of uh, um, Education, um, primarily dealt with desegregation of southern schools, played a big role in that. Um, it now is, uh, when the Department of Education was created, it became its own uh, office with uh, its own assistant secretary. Um, it's a relatively small office, about 550 people, um, with regional offices across the country. Um, I would give you more details about how the Office of Civil Rights runs, uh, but it is the most insular organization I have ever studied. Um, they didn't allow me to interview anyone when I set up interviews in the regional offices. Um, the regional officer told, don't speak to you, and don't really? speak to him. Um, I've talked to other people who have studied uh, civil rights regulation uh, in the 80s, 90s, and after, and they ran to the same thing. Um, they do, one of the things I think is really important is that they do most of their work through responding to complaints. Now, some of, many of these complaints are individualized, so therefore they don't publicize the details because of confidentiality. 
But it, it's really hard to figure out what the investigative process is because it's all kept in secret until there's a resolution. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it's been a very difficult organization to kind of look inside the black box. And what are these regional offices, by the way? Are they just one in every state, or how does this work? There's one, um, as I think there are 10, um, with most organizations like EPA and others, there are, there are uh, the country's bro broken into 10 regions, and there's a regional <laughs> office in each one. For I just, the, the other agency I know best is EPA, yep. um, and the regional administrators were all political appointees. Um, and they had, there's some political accountability there. For offices, civil rights are all civil service uh, appointed, so they um, they can't be changed by the incoming administration. Yeah. Um, okay, so we talked about athletics, and let's let's move on, on to sexual harassment. Sure. So, where did this evolution of Title IX's direction come from? Right. Um, once again, here you got the, the policy leapfrogging. Yeah. Um, the uh, you, the office of civil rights did virtually nothing about sexual harassment until the mid 1990s. By then there was a relatively well-established set of legal precedents on Title VII of the Civil Rights Act that applies to employment discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, a really interesting history. There are a few court cases um, uh, in the 1970s, not very much. The very last day of the Carter administration, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, led by, all, uh, by um, Eleanor Holmes Norton issued sexual harassment regulations um, that remained in effect despite the protest of the Reagan administration. Um, and then the court started to interpret those to follow those. Um, and then when um, uh, OCR first started to look at this in the 1990s, they said, well, well, we have all this Title VII precedent. We'll just incorporate the whole thing. Yeah. No we're talking again about a statute, right, in Title IX, yeah. and just to read it one more time, I don't mean to be pedantic, but no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal assistance. So when OCR began to map sexual harassment onto this statute mm -hmm. um, based on the Title VII experience, did they point to any one specific part of that and say this is you know, harassment is, is, is the denial of benefits of mm -hmm. education, or how did they right. tap I mean, it in? That, that was a very curious thing. So why, the, the big question is, why is sexual harassment sexual discrimination? Right. When the courts first started to look at this, um, they said, well, it's sexual discrimination because if a, if a, heter a heterosexual male harasses a woman, it is because of her sex. Mm -hmm. If a gay man harasses a gay man is because of his sex. Mm -hmm. um, but then the court said, in a footnote, said, well, but if it's a bisexual harasser, they're indiscriminate, and therefore they're not covered. Oh. Um, when uh, Robert Bork was on the DC Circuit, he wrote a, a dissent that was, I believe, joined by uh, Judge Scalia the, um, and Judge Starr at the time, said, well, this is crazy. You know, if Congress had meant to cover sexual harassment, they would not have left um, uncovered people who were attacked by a bisexual. So this is just nuts. Yeah. But uh, there was no response to that. But the, the court basically said, well, you know, we, we're just going to declare that sexual harassment is sexual discrimination. Now, one could argue, and this is what the Supreme Court said in 1998 and 1999, but pretty good decisions by Justice um, Senator Day O'Connor said, if the, if the harassment is severe and repeated and the institution does nothing to stop it, right. then that's really denying people um, uh, educational opportunity. And let's face it, it's almost always against women. Yeah. So that made some sense. But then uh, the Office for Civil Rights said, no, no, we're not going to accept those Supreme Court limitations. We're going to go off in a much different direction. Right. And so as with any statute like this, it, it's at least this one is focused first and foremost on the institution itself yeah. and what it's doing. Right. And the shift, though, becomes a Title IX focusing not on what the institution is doing, but what, on its, what it's failing to do. Right. In effect, creating a hostile educational environment, I guess mm -hmm. you'd call it, mm -hmm. um, by, by failing to proactively uh, prevent and guard against mm -hmm. harassment and assault and so right. on. That's how they... That, that's how they did it? Right. I mean, that, and that is, that's a big leap that people didn't pay much attention to. It's, yeah. not the, it's not the policies of the school. It is their responsibility to police 
the thousands of students and faculty members. Now, in the employment context, it makes a little more sense because employers have more control over what their employees are doing, usually. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, and they can fire them more easily. Um, the, uh, when you jumped from the uh, employment context to the educational employment, one problem you ran into is this covers kids from kindergarten through graduate school. Right. Um, and uh, uh, most employers don't have kids running around during recess. Um, and most employers don't you should have... should go to Silicon Valley sometimes. <laughs> right, that's true. Yeah. Uh, and most employers don't have um, uh, dorm rooms where everyone is unsupervised for most of the day. Yeah. Um, so the context is a lot different. It's really hard to monitor what is going on, but that's what the school's requirement has been. And I just add one other thing, which is um, the Supreme Court said if there's really pervasive and continuing sexual harassment and assault. That's one thing. But what, what OCR has said is that the school has a responsibility to eliminate, eliminate and remedy all forms of sexual assault and sexual harassment. That's a pretty big requirement. That's one of the real great ironies of the story, right? You had from the middle of the 20th century towards the end of the 20th century this push to get schools out of the business of acting as the substitute parents for students right. and monitoring their morals and, their, and the, the morality of their behavior. But then you have this turn towards the end yeah. where, in effect, Title IX becomes a reinforcement, mm -hmm. a command for schools to take on that role. Mm -hmm. And so you have schools today in this odd position, on the one hand, disclaiming sort of moral authority to tell mm -hmm. students what to do. But on the other hand, in this one very specific mm -hmm. realm, you have the, the schools really keenly focused on, on the activity of their students. A few mm -hmm. years ago, I think uh, Char Charlotte Allen or Heather McDonald did a, a magazine piece on this and called it the, the New Victorians, mm -hmm. right? And said that suddenly we have mm -hmm. school administrators acting like the new moral authorities uh, in school in this one very limited way. Yeah. So I, I think there are two takeaways from this. The first is when um, social norms, social mores break down, <coughs> there's, there's an effort to try to re establish it through written legal rules. Yeah. Um, and those, li those written legal rules tend to be usually over-inclusive. Um, so that's one story. The other is that you're exactly right that we um, are trying to reimpose a certain set of norms about sex, but in a very, very odd way. Yeah. Um, one, one of the oddities are, are the things you cannot say. <laughs> you cannot say, don't drink too much. Um, because, especially if you're a woman, don't drink too much because that would put you in a dangerous situation because that has been interpreted as putting too much of the burden on women. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, you, what you can't say is, um, you should limit your sex to committed relationships. Yeah. Uh, no, that, because that, that is putting too many limits on people's use of their individual freedom. So the emphasis is much more on healthy relationships. Um, it really takes a public health um, model of what is really a, a much more basic issue about um, interpersonal relations and norms. So we, we have this, this sort of evolution of, of the policy on harassment. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to 2014 mm -hmm. where uh, the, the Obama administration announces what they called a new paradigm mm -hmm. on sexual harassment on campuses. Mm -hmm. What was that? The, um, in 2011 and again in 2014. Oh, you're right, 2011. Uh, well, but there, the 2014 actually was probably more important. The task force. Um, so uh, with, with a lot of help from the Obama White House, and especially the Vice President's office, um, extensive new guidelines were issued. Um, and the, combined, these were, Stu Terrell is here, you might be able to remind me of how long, probably 50 or 60 pages. Um, and uh, 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 very, very detailed rules. Uh, many of these were on the procedures for handling sexual assault charges. Um, that's where the requirement the schools must use the relatively lenient preponderance of the evidence rule. Um, and there are many, many more details about the procedure. Not, not, not to interrupt, but just sexual assault charges, right? That, yes. that, that in and of itself is interesting, right? We're not talking yeah. about criminal charges. We're not talking yes. about, about the criminal justice. We're talking about the school's role in, in hearing and, and adjudicating complaints about sexual assault. Or Absolutely. And so let me just, um, yeah. the, one of the issues that always comes up in that regard is people say, well, why aren't these things handled in the criminal justice system? Um, 
And if, if there is a case of where it meets the criminal justification of rape, these things should be handled um, at least in part in the criminal justice process because you don't want people who are actually engaged in criminal activity to be thrown out of school and then uh, uh, engage in criminal activity elsewhere as has happened. But there is, I think there is an argument that there are some forms of um, sexual misconduct that are proper for schools to adjudicate. Um, things that don't arise to the level of of a criminal activity, but the school might think is improper. If, if I, believe it or not, my school, Boston College, being a Jesuit school, says that sex outside marriage is prohibited. Now, they never enforce this, but if uh, Brigham Young wants to enforce that, uh, this strikes me as fine. Um, uh, and uh, one of the reasons you can say uh, is useful for bringing some of these cases to a college adjudication rather than criminal justice system. The criminal justice system has a very high standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It's very hard to prove that. Um, so I think a lower level of proof where the criminal um, sanctions are less um, makes some sense. But still, there's need for some sort of due process. And that has been the number one issue. Um, uh, Stuart and Casey Johnson have written a wonderful book about this. Um, it's spell, spilled over in freedom of speech. Laura Kipnis has wrote a really good book about it. And, and El, uh, Emily Yaffe has written some terrific pieces in The Atlantic about this. So I think it's been covered uh, very well. The thing I would add to that is that um, these offices were also charged with training everybody in the university, not only just about adjudication, but of what healthy sexual relations are. Um, and that is quite a stretch, a change in the role of this compliance office to basically be the, the instructor on all things sexual in universities. Yeah, it's a whole different kind of compliance. Um, so you have, the, you have the 2011 announcement of a new paradigm and then this task force mm -hmm. report. So the Obama White House, as you said, all the way up to the vice president's office and beyond, makes this a central priority. I mean, I, sort of fittingly, mm -hmm. since at the origin of Title IX, they wanted accountability all the way mm -hmm. to the president in the rulemaking process mm -hmm. here in this this other way, you have the White House, the yeah. president, really taking control of this issue and making it a national priority. Right. So then what happens? Yeah. So the first thing to note is this is not kind of bubbling up from below. This is really coming down from the top. It was the White House and the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights, uh, Catherine Lehman, and uh, Russ, Russell and Ali. What the, the really odd part of this is that uh, you had a situation where OCR went way beyond what the Supreme Court had required, uh, you know, qu quite clearly far beyond what the Supreme Court had said uh, Title IX requires. How did they get around this? They said, well, the, uh, the Supreme Court was writing about damage suits, private rights of action. We have another set of rules. Uh, for you to qualify for federal funds. Mm -hmm. But then they had a problem. They can't rely on the courts for enforcement. They can't cut off federal funds, so what do they do? Um, and they came up with what I think was a very clever strategy, which is we're going to embarrass schools by having these very expensive investigations. And we're going to start with those universities that value their, their reputation most. We're going to uh, take every complaint and make it turn it into a systematic evaluation of the entire institution. So it's going to cost a lot of money and take a long time. It might even take years. Mm -hmm. um, so the investigation, the process became the punishment. Yeah. And we're going to kind of force people to engage, to enter into legally binding compliance agreements with these new large organizations. And that became the primary enforcement mechanism. So before you get to the enforcement, though, the, the OCR is announcing policies. Mm -hmm. And it's doing it through a mechanism called Dear Colleague mm -hmm. Letters. And I have to admit, this might be my right. favorite sort of yeah name of a document right, in all yeah. administration, dear yeah. colleague yeah. letters. Who are the colleagues? The <laughs> right. Colleagues, the yeah. colleagues are. Yeah, many many uh, college presidents and high school principals and superintendents do not think that uh, OCR is their colleague. Rather, they think of them as their nemesis. Uh, so, so OCR issues these letters, yeah. including a few on uh, setting forth new guidance on the process for the school, the, the process that the schools need to adopt mm -hmm. uh, under Title IX for the adjudication of complaints about sexual assault and mm -hmm. sexual harassment. Right. This creates quite a stir, not just among the usual quarters, but I remember at Harvard Law School, a public letter signed mm -hmm. by 28 professors or 38 mm -hmm. professors or something, criticizing um, uh, from, a, from a, a civil libertarian mm -hmm. standpoint mm -hmm. the procedures that are being imposed upon the schools. Right. 
Um, yeah, one of the interesting responses to this uh, is that groups that ordinarily would have cheered most of the things the Obama administration did, whether it be associations representing professors, um, the uh, bar associations uh, specialized in general, and probably most impressively, a variety of law professors um, at Cornell, at Georgetown, uh, and most prominently at Harvard Law School, where um, the, uh, and I think the most eloquent statement of this was by four women law professors at Harvard, mm -hmm. uh, very eminent uh, legal uh, minds, who wrote uh, basically say that we do not think that dealing with the problem of sexual assault should require us to throw away so many due process protections. Um, and I really encourage people to, to read that if you're interested in this topic, because it's really a very short, convincing argument about the dangers of lack of due process. Who that was, if it was Janet Hawley or Nancy Gertner or... or uh, um, and Jeannie Sue Gerson yeah. and um, one other person who is, I should remember, but I forgot. You cite, you cite uh, Jeannie Sue Gerson's work in your book. She right. and her hus husband, Jacob Gerson, who's a scholar of, the admin of administrative law, had an article yeah. a couple years ago in California Law Review called the, the Sex Bureaucracy. I think yes. you adopt the title right. for one of your chapter titles. Wasn't right, it? yeah. It's a terrific article because they go through um, so many of the school's procedures um, and their statements of what they're doing. Um, it's California Law Review called the Sex Bureaucracy, and it's terrific. So we have all of this on sexual harassment on the way to sexual assault. At the same time that this is becoming, or, or shortly after this becomes a, a, a national debate, fueled in part by not just um, the, 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 the assault at, at Duke, which Stuart Taylor writes mm -hmm. about in his book, mm -hmm. but then the allegations mm -hmm. of misconduct at the University of Virginia, which mm -hmm. became a scandal mm -hmm. of its own. Mm -hmm. Right around the same time, you have OCR move also in another direction on gender. Right. Um, and again, just to go back to the statute, it says no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded, et cetera, et cetera. But the discussion of, of, of the basis of sex gets translated into a, a debate over gender. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you have OCR um, not just dealing with discrimination in athletics or, or sexual uh, harassment or assault on campus, but now getting deeply enmeshed in a national debate over who we are as people in terms of gender as distinct from sex. Mm -hmm. So where does this come from? I would start with a story that I was a member of the uh, New Hampshire Advisory Commission Committee for the US Civil Rights Commission. Um, and the chairman was a law professor uh, from New Hampshire, who was really a really smart, interesting guy. And one of the sociologists on the panel said, well, let's not confuse sex and gender, because they're completely different things. And he and I looked at each other and said, really? <laughs> um, really hadn't thought about that before. Um, we realized how far behind times we were. So here, uh, what is interesting about this transgender issue is you see the divergence here between what the law says and the sexual stereotype interpretation of the law. Mm -hmm. So what the law says is you can't discriminate on the basis of sex. But you can, in some circumstances, have sex-segregated facilities. In the laws and the regulations, very clear. You can have separate dorm rooms. You can have separate bathrooms, uh, separate teams. So it allows the difference between uh, male and female um, on the basis of, I'm going to use the word, again, sex is the word that's used. The idea of, uh, of gender stereotyping is that gender identity has nothing to do with biological sex. Um, it has to do with one's innermost feelings. Um, and that, uh, therefore, the argument is if you are going to eliminate stereotypes, you've got to allow people to express their gender identity. So that line of thought that has been endorsed now by, I believe, three circuit courts said you cannot, um, you've got to uh, segregate facilities only on the basis of gender identity because otherwise is to punish per someone for their failure to form to sexual stereotypes. Mm -hmm. So, but the law does say sex. Yeah. Um, and if sex and gender identity are different, then um, the legal standard for this is really weak. Now, obviously, there's been a, a contentious national debate um, culturally and politically. Mm -hmm. But as somebody who studies mm -hmm. bureaucracy, mm -hmm. where did this come from? And, 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 mm -hmm. and how did it, how did it so quickly take on such central importance at OCR. Yeah. Because you say a couple yeah. of times in the book that unlike the athletics and harassment debates, which unfolded relatively mm -hmm. slowly, step by step, mm -hmm. 
this debate is one that, that really exploded. Yeah. Um, and suddenly it was, I remember the New Republic did a cover story years ago, right on the, either on the heels of the Supreme Court same-sex marriage decision or right before it. And it was a cover story that said, um, it, it, it had a photograph of, a, of somebody who's transgendered, and the cover story was, this is the next great civil rights mm -hmm. uh, struggle. Mm -hmm. And the Weekly Standard, the next week, reprinted that cover on the back page. They have a, 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 a feature they call parody. Mm -hmm. And this one they called not a parody. And they just reprinted the cover uh, uh, as if it was self-evident mm -hmm. that it was ridiculous, mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that gender issues would be the next civil rights mm -hmm. structure, well, uh, struggle. Well, it turned out to be exactly, mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. correct. Yeah. So how did this come about? Uh, this is a big mystery to me about how it appeared so uh, quickly. Let me kind of, as far as the OCR stories, I can kind of give you the basic yeah, story, which is um, that uh, the Obama White House was under increasing pressure um, from around 2010 to 2014 to issue guidelines basically saying that um, the transgender uh, individuals are subject, uh, are covered by anti-discrimination law. Not just Title IX, but Title VII as well. President Obama resisted this. He said, I agree with the policy, but in order to do that, we need to change the laws. And they, there was legislation that was pending before Congress. That I think when the Democrats were in control of Congress, had some chance of passing. Um, by 2014, it became clear that the legislation was going to get nowhere. Um, and, I th and the Obama administration was facing increasing pressure from uh, uh, gay rights uh, groups, um, and finally issued a variety of orders um, to the EEO, uh, the changes came at the EEOC, the Justice Department, the Labor Department, and the Education Department. So this was clearly a top down. Uh, and why was it then? My guess is that part of it was because once the gay marriage issue had been resolved, um, this became the number one issue of gay rights groups, and they felt very profoundly about this. And the other thing, you know, one of the reasons I think it catches on is, you know, uh, when people see cases of people who are suffering from what psychologists call gender dysphoria, the, the response is, be sympathetic, have compassion. Um, these, are, these are usually kids um, who are you know, really struggling, and so of course we ought to deal sympathetically with them. What is strange is that this then got converted into a nationwide prohibition on any use of flexibility by schools to deal with these problems. So in terms of the actual mm -hmm. policy, this most famously um, arrives at the, the OCR's Dear Colleague Letters on uh, gender and bathrooms in in, right. in public schools, mm -hmm. or right. I guess in all schools. Um, right. Mm -hmm. um, but you have a quote in, in the book from uh, the assistant secretary, uh, Lamon from OCR, where she tells an interviewer, uh, quote, the bathroom question was never just about a bathroom. It is about who that child is at school and how that child will be perceived and mm -hmm. seen. Yeah. And you really, you dwell on this, I think rightly so, right? this idea that it was a policy focused on who, the ch who a child is and how that child will be perceived and seen by others. These are fundamental questions, right. who a child is. Right. And you had OCR through the, the, the Dear Colleague letters um, trying to elaborate policy on this mm -hmm. subject. On the last point, though, about this sort of progress, you, you tie in uh, one of my favorite books by one of my favorite legal scholars. Mm -hmm. Alex Bickle wrote the book, mm -hmm. The Supreme Court and the Idea of Progress. Mm -hmm. And you translate that to the idea of Title IX and the idea of progress. I think it's a very powerful idea that, that there is the, the, the notion of progress, that we are on this, this, this one-way road in a very particular direction. And once one problem is solved, well, then the, it's on to the next step. Um, could you just explain that a little bit? Right. What's remarkable about Title IX is how successful it's been. Yeah. You know, um, that uh, women are not just equal to men in most educational institutions these days. They are surpassing them more and more. Um, so once that, a lot of those problems have been surprised. I'm not saying we don't have any problems with uh, discrimination against women in educational institutions, but um, we've made enormous progress. But the idea of behind, um, I, I think, many, peop many courts and many administrators' view is, well, there's a not always another problem to be solved. And increasingly, you go through from, from what institutions doing to what members of the institution they're doing to what 
uh, members of the public are doing. So this idea of eliminating stereotypes means you've got to change how everyone thinks about sex. And is sex binary? And I think part of the uh, argument here is we should get people to stop thinking about sex as being binary um, or being even biological. Uh, so the attack on stereotypes is the attack on basically on all conventional understandings of sex, um, which is a pretty big um, uh, agenda, um, especially to be based on a, such a small statute. And I just say one thing on that, which is you know we're all familiar with the arguments about the living constitution. The idea here is that you really have a living statute. Yeah. Um, so the meaning of the statute changes over time. But of course, um, if, uh, if we want, think that public opinion and political culture is changing, there's no reason why that couldn't be done by Congress. The idea is to be done by the courts and agencies, I think, is a perversion of constitutional government. One other theme that you touch on very early on in the book, another one of my favorite legal books, actually, um, you invoke Mary Ann Glendon's mm -hmm. Rights Talk yeah. book, or classic book from the 80s, on how the, the, the shift in American political dialogue away from policy towards the absolutism of rights, mm -hmm. Glennon argued, deformed our political dialogue, that we're now arguing everything in categorical absolutes and making it harder and harder to compromise on things. And you point out that that seems to be one of the dynamics in this sphere, too, where everything is debated in terms of rights. You have a right, you don't have a right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and with, with no room left for compromise. Mm -hmm. Could you I think this bit? feeds into the, the way in which rulemaking has proceeded or not proceeded, that if you view these issues as merely as rights, then you don't have to look at causes, consequences, alternatives. You just kind of think, what does this mean to me? Um, and I think that that rationale uh, fed into the view that we don't have to go through the regular policymaking process, because this isn't even policy. This is just our understanding of the rights. And this cuts both ways, right? I mean, just in the course of this conversation, we've talked about free speech rights on mm -hmm. campus. We've talked about due process rights on campus. Mm -hmm. And those arguments, too, from critics of the, the direction Title IX has taken, those are themselves sort of categorical, absolutist, rights talk arguments mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Now, so a lot of things we've touched on in terms of the gender debates and so on, these are debates that the whole country's been having, and I do want to sort of end, before we open up to questions, do you want to end with the bureaucratic story? You're talking about um, the shift near the end of the Obama administration, where after disclaiming the authority to, to take certain steps, saying, the President says, no, these statutes need to be changed first, mm -hmm. then finally they go it alone. Yeah. And that is a story we saw echoes of in other aspects of the Obama administration, most famously with immigration, mm -hmm. where President Obama repeatedly resisted calls mm -hmm. to, to, to change federal immigration law. He told groups from the progressive left, I can't make these changes. Mm -hmm. with, these are changes that have to be made in the statute. Mm -hmm. And then finally, near the end, they made the move themselves through things like enforcement discretion and so on. And of course, that's not a story that exclusive, that's exclusive to the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. Every administration finds, especially near, as their time is running out, that suddenly the things they thought they needed legislation for suddenly become the things that, oh, they, they decided, oh, wait, we can do this on our own. Um, so all of this echoes other aspects of administration. You spent the first part of your career studying the Clean Air Act. Mm -hmm. To what extent is Title IX like the other things you've studied in your career? And to what extent is it, is it very unlike the other things you've studied? Right. Uh, I say on, on, on the unlike, I was really struck by the lack of analysis um, and the lack of transparency. Um, I think that uh, most agencies are much better at this. And the fact that when I, when I studied EPA, people were happy to talk to me. Um, when I studied the food stamp program, people were happy to talk to me. Um, I view this as an unbelievably closed operation. I hope that will change. Here, uh, but you pointed to the way to a perennial problem, not actually not perennial, a current problem in American politics is what happens when you have um, statutes, some of which are quite detailed, like the Clean Air Act or like immigration. Um, and uh, Congress is unable to make any changes. You know, a lot of this comes back to the fact that Congress um, doesn't pass many laws these days um, and is not dealing with crucial issues. So what is an administration to do? Mm -hmm. um, and it, there's no easy answer to that. I don't want to be moralistic about um, that they should uh, uh, not try to address some of these issues. Um, but there is this tremendous temptation to do 
what used to be done or probably done through the legislative process administratively. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's also a tendency, given the fact that there's going to be controversy about anything you to do, you do is to do it in the quickest, easiest way. Um, I will say that I think the Trump administration ha um, has uh, unfortunate con uh, tendencies in this direction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, partly because of the nature of politics these days, partly because of the personality of people in the White House. Uh, but that, I think, is the biggest challenge we face of when you have partisan polarization, when you have Congress, it's hard to pass laws, how do you re install the idea that this should be a nation of laws and of constitutional governance rather than of administrative judicial um, dictation. I mean, the, the, the gridlock issue is a real one. I wonder if the relationship runs in both directions, yeah. right? On the one hand, yeah. Congress isn't acting so agencies do. Yeah. On the other hand, at the same time, <laughs> the fact that the agencies are out there able Absolutely. to take quick action in some ways relieves the pressure on Congress. I think one of the reasons why co Congress is so gridlocked mm -hmm. It's because it's not, it, it, it is able to just sit idly by mm -hmm. and watch the, the, the civil rights state, the administrative mm -hmm. state, do its own thing. Mm -hmm. And the proponents of a given administration in Congress know that they don't have any reason to compromise mm -hmm. in legislation because the administration mm -hmm. will do it. And an administration's mm -hmm. critics have no reason mm -hmm. to come forward with compromises because they know that if the administration doesn't get all that it wants, it will just go it alone. Mm -hmm. So I kind of wonder if that relationship works in both directions. I, I think that's definitely the case. I, um, in the athletic regulations or sexual harassment, there's a fair amount of support in Congress for what OCR was doing. And when there were critics, um, uh, the, the supporters uh, came to defense. So it's not like a situation where OCR is basically just thumbing its nose at Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's a lot easier to say, well, let them do it. We don't have to. So we have a lot of smart folks in the room who have been very patient. Um, so we welcome questions. Just a couple of things. Uh, first of all, again, this is being uh, live streamed and taped. So please uh, turn on your microphone when it's your turn and speak into the microphone. Please identify yourself. Um, and with that, let's open the floor. Does anybody have any, any questions? There's one of that. Come forward, sir, and, and, and speak into one of the microphones up here, uh, right here at the table. And be sure to push the, the button to turn it on. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the recent lawsuit filed against the Civil Rights Office yeah. uh, alleging that they changed the internal guidance to its staff, um, basically making it easier for them to dismiss complaints uh, based on uh, use of department resources, mm -hmm. uh, which is a sort of, and, and the legal argument being that this went, went without notice and comment, which was the same sort of argument that uh, conservative groups had mm -hmm. raised during the last administration. So I'm guessing if you can maybe comment both on the substance of that change and the procedure by which it was effectuated. Sure, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, just to give people background, there was a suit filed um, by a, a variety of uh, civil rights and human rights groups um, challenging the Trump administration's decision to make some changes in the enforcement procedures of how they investigated uh, civil, uh, Title IX complaints. Um, the first thing I'd say about this is, is, uh, is a lot of is significant irony. Um, on the one hand, you know, we used to think of enforcement priorities as being something that is within the discretion of the agency, not subject to rules. Mm -hmm. um, so the argument here is the fact, despite the fact that the OCR for its rules doesn't use notice and comment rulemaking, for its enforcement procedures, it must. I can't think that, I don't think that they think they're going to win this. I can't believe they really take it seriously. I think this is primarily a uh, kind of a public relations ploy to call attention to the change in enforcement procedures. Um, I wish there were more transparency in the enforcement procedures, what they investigate. But I think one of the big issues here is the, the Trump administration said when we receive from one person, 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 complaints, we are not under the obligation to look into each one of these uh, because those complaints really eat up resources. And there are many of these complaints filed by one person have thousands of individual um, schools. Um, so they basically say, we're not going to allow these outside groups to set our enforcement priorities. I think that is a proper thing to do. Um, but um, given the centrality of uh, complaint investigations of the policymaking process, uh, 
Um, I would hope the Trump administration would be a little more forthcoming about um, what it what it does. And we it would like I'd like to know more about who are these people who are filing all of these complaints. Um, the in the very end of the uh, Obama administration, Catherine Lehman said, "We need many more resources. We need more people because we have so many complaints." Well, six thousand of those complaints were filed by one person. <laughs> Um, so uh, the, the volume of complaints is not a very good um, indication of how much work they have to do. You know, you mentioned early on that, that the, that the um, and thank you sir, for your question, um, you mentioned early on in that answer that the lawsuit in many ways reflects the sorts of lawsuits we saw during the Obama administration coming from conservatives, mm -hmm. right? And that's, of course, that's always true, right, that, that, that every administration in a way, whether Democrat or Republican, has its own interests as the administration and it adopts the tools of its predecessors. But there's a lot of continuities, right, from, mm -hmm. from Bush to Obama to Trump, to their administrations, whatever their differences are on policy, there's a lot of continuities in terms of the tools they use to make policy or mm -hmm. unmake mm -hmm. policy and the tools that their critics use, um, whether litigation or otherwise, to stop or to slow down those changes. We're reminded of that this week, I guess last night, um, when the Justice Department announced that it would not defend an aspect, uh, it would not defend the legality or constitutionality of a statute in the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I wasn't watching the hockey game, I had an eye on Twitter, and I was watching these debates unfold where the, the, the Trump administration's critics were complaining about the Justice Department's non-enforcement of the statutes, uh, of the statute, or non-defense of the statute. And then you had conservatives um, invoking the last administration's non-defense of, of the Defense of Marriage mm -hmm. Act mm -hmm. um, or waiving aspects of the, of the ACA. So I take it that you, say, you think that there is real continuity between the Obama administration and the Trump administration in the way they use the tools of OCR. Right. Do you think that now that the shoe is on the other foot for both of them, mm -hmm. for, for both the, you know, the, the left and the right, do you think there's any chance that there could be structural legislative reform, or do you think this is just one of those things where everybody will just keep switching sides from administration yeah. to administration? I can't see much chance of, of legislative change. Um, it will be interesting to see what OCR does. Uh, just yesterday, Ken Marcus was confirmed to be Assistant Secretary for uh, Civil Rights. I think he's a very capable guy. Um, he has a, his work cut out for him. My guess is that they will try to um, go through the rulemaking process that Secretary DeVos promised on sexual harassment and gender, uh, transgender issues, that's going to be enough. I think that the complaint processing system is so deeply entrenched in bureaucratic uh, task structure that that probably won't change. Um, but um, it, more transparency in what they're investigating could be useful. I thought it was interesting. Secretary DeVos gave that, that speech at George Mason University sort of promising yeah. to use the yeah. much more transparent process. Yeah. And it sounded like yeah. the sort of thing you say at the beginning of an administration, <laughs> right. less than at the end of an administration. Right. She said, reporters called me up after that and said, so um, I assume this will be out in a few months. Yeah. And I said, I don't think so. Um, and it hasn't even started yet. In September, they said they're going to propose a rule. And that will take months or years after that. So that's going to drag on for a long time. The disadvantage of noticing a man rulemaking is very slow. The advantage is that it's participatory. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mike Irosh, just no affiliation. Um, what do you think is driving this lack of transparency? And would not more transparency sort of be, be positive in terms of educating those that uh, can see what what's the actual situation is? Right. I, what's driving it, I think, is about 40 years or 50 years of controversy. Everything that OCR um, is involved in can be controversial. It started with school desegregation. Um, and then it moved to um, uh, bilingual education, um, and then athletics, and then sexual harassment. So they figured they're going to circle the wagons. Um, and another aspect of this, I don't want to go into too much history, but you talked about um, uh, suits from the left. Um, the, the entire structure of OCR was determined by a famous court suit that was filed in 1972 called Adams versus Richardson. And the court, um, in an appendix said, well, we really expect the agency to investigate every complaint and to do so within a particular set of t uh, time constraints. Um, the Reagan administration said, OK, we'll be happy to do this. We'll just make sure that we have short investigations and meet our quota. Um, and that process is, is in uh, 
still in, in process today. So a lot of the kind of lack of transparency comes in the very process of we're going to be looking at individual complaints. Um, and we can't tell you all the details of that because a lot of that's private. But where they, you could have transparency, obviously, is in the rulemaking process. And I think they have to show um, you know, a few more guts on that. Um, and the Secretary of Voss, I think, has put them in a situation where they are going to have to come through on that. Yeah. And who, by the way, who was President Reagan's original head of OCR? Um, Clarence Thomas. That's right. Uh, next question, and sir. Charles Schott, uh, Center for Financial Stability. Um, has OMB fallen down on the job with this? Because they have an office called OIRA, yeah. which is designed to, in the rulemaking process, minimize the intrusiveness of regulations. Yeah. And it strikes me what you almost have here could be argued as a conspiracy by other federal agencies to move to compliance and dear colleague letters that are designed to circumvent. Yeah. And, cool. and at some point, having worked in interagency inter reviews, you get the ability of one of the participants to sort of call a halt to this yeah. and say, we want to put on the agenda the need for a restatement of the rules in this, because what you guys have done has been create rules and we need to make that process yeah. transparent and, and, and tangible. Right. That's a, uh, thanks for that comment. I, there are people here who know a lot more about OIRA and in agency review than I do. But I think that one of the reasons that uh, a, uh, OCR and many other agencies have avoided rulemaking is to avoid OIRA. Um, and I would just give that the two rulemakings by OCR that I'm familiar with, real rulemaking, one was the 1975 Title IX, in which there was significant interagency review. In review within the various parts of um, HEW at the time in the Office of Education. And that had a real effect. Um, and the other were, were abortive regulations that the Carter administration tried on bilingual education. And um, the interagency review um, ended up killing those. Um, so I think that. Um, Th th this is a very important part of the process. One of the people I would suggest you talk with uh, at, at Hoover is John Kogan, mm -hmm. who was the deputy head of OMB and has, I think, been asked twice to come back and be uh, the, the director of OMB and who spends his career studying uh, these things. He's just got a new book on, on why all of the regulations end up uh, uh, costing so much. Uh, um, and uh, he would probably be a good person to talk with about that. That's good. I just wrote a very favorable review of his book in the Claremont Review of Books, so maybe he'll be uh, kindly disposed towards me. Yeah, the book's yeah. called The High, High Cost of Good Intentions. Right. That's really, it's a, it's really great. Very good book. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, Vishwa Guya. I work in advertising. You mentioned that in some cases um, a lower standard of proof um, makes sense, and, and I was curious about that. Why does that make sense for the same act, which is a criminal act? Right. That's, uh, that's an important question. Um, why do we have such a high burden of proof in the criminal justice process? Because we're going to put people in jail. Um, when, when you don't put people in jail, when you, you know, expel, uh, suspend them for a few semesters or throw them out of school, I think that it's appropriate not to have that high a level of proof. However, okay, um, and this is a point that Stuart Taylor has made very well, let's remember that when you brand someone a rapist, even if they don't go to jail, that's going to have a profound effect on their life and their opportunities. Um, so this idea that you have preponderance of the evidence, which is, many people have said, is kind of you know, an equal, equal, uh, equal believability plus a feather on one side, when the consequences can be so severe. Um, that's not a good uh, way of handling it either. Um, I will say that I think that um, uh, maybe this is my since I'm a political scientist and not a lawyer. I think the exact formulation of the burden of proof is not as important as the structures that are created. And the thing that I find most objectionable about what many schools have done is to create a single investigator appointed by the Title IX administrator who has to show that they're getting tough on sexual assault, and that single administrator does the investigation, um, determines whether the person is responsible or not, and there's almost no opportunity for appeal. Um, and I see that George Washington University just instituted that. Um, and I think we've got to pay attention not just to the legal standards, but to the s structures that are set up and um, whether there's impartiality. 
This gets back to some of the concerns that were raised mm -hmm. by law professors, mm -hmm. including the ones at Harvard, I think, mm -hmm. that went not just to the nominal standard of proof, but the procedures and the, and the structure. Right. Uh, Cross-examination, use of lawyers, yeah. availability of evidence. Yeah. And then, and then you next. Go ahead. Phil Wallach, R Street Institute. Um, you have a subheading in one of the chapters on the athletics called uh, the failed counterattack 2001 to 2008. And, you know, for for something yeah. where you, you would think, you know, that President Bush appointed as his education secretary Rod Page, a former football coach. The yeah. Speaker of the House was a, wrestl a former wrestling coach at the time. There was sort of every reason to think that conservatives at various times in the early 2000s were in position to sort of fight back, and they mostly, mostly didn't. So I was just curious to hear your reflections on that. Yeah, that really goes to the uh, question about the political support for many of these rules. Um, I just I answer that by giving a uh, comparison. In um, the late 1970s, the uh, Office for Civil Rights was about to issue some rules on regulate on on sports, um, and Joe Califano had to meet with Tip O'Neill from Boston College football, um, John Bradamus, who represents. Uh, Notre Dame, among others, um, and Jim Wright from Texas. What, it, what were they concerned about? Don't issue those rules that might hurt football. And Joe Califano said, I'm not going to do anything with these guys. You know, the speaker, the chairman of the education department, and the and majority leader opposed to it. So they kind of dropped those. Um, look at uh, after 2001. Um, the Bush administration wants to make some changes in the rules about uh, sports, basically saying that you can go back a little bit more to the relative interest um, standard rather than the strict proportionality. So let's have more methods for determining what the interest of students are. You know, that's, that's fairly mild. Um, that was uh, strongly opposed by Democrats. Um, in Congress, I think a, major, a large majority of Democrats, um, and most importantly, I think opposed by the NCAA. You know, one thing I haven't talked about is one of the devils in this book is the NCAA, um, for for many reasons. But basically, they after trying to kill Title IX, they said, "Okay, we're just going to take over women's sports, and we're going to do for women's sports what we did for men's sports," um, and they did it. <laughs> Um, there was another uh, organization right. for women's yeah. sports that was basically put out of business by the NCAA. Right, right. and um, that, uh, that other organization said they should be student athletes. Um, they shouldn't be recruited. They shouldn't have scholarships. They shouldn't um, have uh, championships uh, organized when there are exams. Um, all the, in my view, all the right things. Yeah. They lost. They were put out by the business by the NCAA. The NCAA said basically as long as you don't touch men's football uh, and men's basketball, we will do everything we can to encourage highly competitive women's sports. And by the way, we'll run the championships. Um, so they opposed it very strongly. And the combination of United Democratic support um, in the NCAA really killed that effort um, by, the, by the Bush administration. Just to build on this, Shep, in studying this history, is there a difference in the politics of, of adding, say, protections yes, for women versus the, the, the politics of taking them away. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, is, is, yeah I'm you glad you brought that, because that's really important. Once, once you establish uh, a protection, which is going to be viewed as a right, um, a I mean, we see this with health care now. Mm -hmm. uh, we see it, uh, it, uh, the, the politics of taking things away is much different from adding them. Partly this has to do with human psychology, because we know that people react much more strongly against th things being taken away than the possibility of something being given. Um, groups get organized, um, you have bureaucracies, you have compliance organizations. So undoing things once they've been done is extraordinarily hard. Great. And uh, two more questions right here, sir, and then Stuart, you have, you'll be last. Jake Goldberg, I'm a Tufts University guy. Huh? Uh, one of the things that I found interesting that's going on in Massachusetts is that the State House has sort of taken it upon themselves to intervene as well, and that's something yeah. we've seen other states do, and they're in the midst right now. The Senate recently passed a bill. It's now being debated in the House to sort of create their own rules, mm -hmm. uh, many mirroring what was going on under the Obama administration, but yeah. could they well run in contradiction with what Secretary DeVos might put out in due mm -hmm. time? And I was wondering if you could just speak to maybe the long-term role of state government stepping in and whether that would be beneficial or detrimental. 
Sure. I, um, first, I'd say that Tufts is an interesting example because Tufts uh, was one of the first to be subject to investigation. Um, and um, the president of Tufts uh, reached agreement with OCR. Um, and then later, OCR said, um, oh, we're going to write a letter saying you're guilty of all of these violations. And he said, hey, I never said that. Um, but then they said, if you don't sign this agreement, you know, we're going to continue to investigate. And he had to cave. Um, yes, states. So this goes to the political popularity of many of these programs. Um, similar legislation was passed by both houses of the California legislature and vetoed by Governor Brown. Um, so uh, these, once these rights um, are, continue, are established, um, and it looks like the, Obama, the uh, Trump administration might pull some of them back, I think you're going to see increasing pressure uh, in, in blue states, in part because you know, if the Trump administration is doing it, it can't be right. Um, uh, and I will say um, that um, if you wanted to have a symbol um, of distrust <laughs> um, for on these issues, probably President uh, Trump is the best example of why people don't trust the administration on gender-related issues. Um, but that means that you know this the red state blue state divide is going to grow larger and larger. And uh, last question from somebody who we know has read the book because right. he's <laughs> blurbs it on the back, Stuart Taylor. Hi, um, um, my co-author Casey Johnson and I, as you know, wrote a book titled "The Campus Rape Frenzy: The Attack on Due Process at America's Universities," which sort of shows where I'm coming from. Um, <clears throat> A question about the politics of this. You have, as I think you've indicated, and I think we indicate in our book, uh, the policies of the Obama administration were very contrary tr to tradition. Mm -hmm. They were very contrary to traditional notices of notions of fairness and due process. Uh, when you get to the transgender stuff in particular, I would think they would not be embraced by the average voter, mm -hmm. uh, if the average voter understood what was going on. And yet, they rolled over all opposition. There was hardly any opposition. You can't find a Republican in Congress, not one Republican, mm -hmm. who has stood up and said, wait a minute, this is going too far. Maybe Senator Alexander has done it a little bit. But people like Senator Rubio, Senator Grassley are joining with liberal Democrats mm -hmm. in more or less supporting uh, the Obama OCR regime. And uh, the question is, what, what explains this? Yeah. Why is the, is the opposition one might expect to see in Congress to this uh, almost non-existent? And by the way, why has every move that Betsy DeVos has made in the direction of, uh, of fairness yeah. been unanimously assailed by every Democrat in Congress who said anything about it? Uh, while being sort of studiously ignored by the Republicans? Those are excellent questions and ones I've puzzled over. And I would say, um, when I've gone around talking about this book, I've thought, well, I'm going to be attacked um, because I'm not supportive of the Obama administration. So far, my experience, even talking to the Harvard Women Law Students Association, um, they've been, people have been pretty respectful and open. So. The, the puzzle for me is why in the political arena these things get black and white. Are you for the Obama administration or are you for the Trump administration? Um, uh, when in other settings um, there is, a, I think, a sensible middle ground where people really are interested in due process and, and free speech. Um, so, and I think it has, part of it has to do with the way in which we've talked about these issues. Since we've put them in terms of rights, you know, are, uh, uh, what about the rights of transgender students? And I will say, just when I'm asked about this, I, so explain to me what these rights are. Um, and you know, people have a hard time coming up with that. Um, but um, once you put it in these terms, especially in these politically polarized times, um, it's really hard. Um, to uh, take a contrary view. But you know, that doesn't really answer your question, because why aren't the Republicans more um, adamant about this? In the Republican platform of 2016, there was this whole section on Title IX, attacking Title IX. Um, uh, so at the convention, there seemed to be a lot of support for that. Um, but among candidates, uh, senators, um, members of the House, not so much. So I, I, I'm not sure. Do you have an answer? <laughs> 
uh, in theory, as a, as a sometime member of the news media, yeah. the news media, I think, the major news media, have been relentlessly biased uh, against every male accused of rape, uh, relentlessly pro-Obama administration on all these issues, relentlessly counterfair against due process. They don't put it that way. And therefore, if a politician, let's say a Republican, uh, is sizing this up and is thinking of speaking out on it, I think he can expect to get a very hostile reception from the news media if he doesn't uh, repeat the line that they're familiar with and that they're advocating themselves. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see to the extent that's changing because I think about uh, uh, people who have written on this, uh, uh, yourself uh, at the top of the list, um, Emily Yaffe, and I just, there was an article in the New York Times, of all places, by Michael Powell. Is that right. was an astonishing article. Right. It's uh, the first fair article the New York Times has written in at least 15 years yes. on any of these issues. It, 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 was, it was a great yeah. article. And I guess you, you stopped writing yeah. for the New York Times more than 15 years ago. So. <laughs> yes. And it was the first uh, sports story in the New York Times that didn't involve concussions. Um, <laughs> I'm always looking at the Times saying, what are the, where the, how, do the, how do the Red Sox do? How do the Patriots do? But of course, they have to write only about concussions. Um, but uh, so I wonder if there is a, a, some subtle change, and it does seem to me there's a real difference between people who do uh, new uh, opinion um, in longer articles um, and and, this, and the reporters on the beat who seem to be take the position that, that you described. Well, so Shep, I've plugged not just the the current book, I've plugged uh, regulation in the courts book. There's one other piece of your writing that I do want to point people to. You wrote a remembrance of James Q. Wilson. Mm -hmm after he passed away. And it's, 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 it's lovely, and it's also uh, a wonderful introduction to Wilson's work for those who didn't know him. Where did that, do you remember where that appeared? Um, it was um, in, originally in the forum, but here's, actually, I'll give, there's, we have a web, put together a website on the work of James Q. Wilson. It, it appears there, and it's called, I think, jqwilson.org. Um, it has, you know, his writings, a lot of the um, uh, tributes to him after he died. Um, well, and another uh, famous Harvard friend that we alluded to at the outset, Harvey Mansfield, uh, as I mentioned, he's going to be here. He's a Hoover Senior Fellow. We're going to have an event with him on June uh, 26th here, a half-day conference on, on, on liberalism, classical liberalism, featuring uh, not just Harvey, but also Jim Caesar, Mark Blitz, and others. And then one other event I want to mention, on June 22nd, we're going to have the latest conference here on our Regulation and the Rule of Law Project, which is chaired by Michael McConnell and Charlie Calamiris. So I hope you'll join us for that. But uh, thank you all for joining us today, Shep. I've learned so much from you and uh, your writings over the years. Uh, and this latest book is no exception. I recommend it so highly, The Transformation of Title IX. Thank you so much for joining well, us Well, thanks today. for having me. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.